Good morning. It's good to come again to Daniel. Uh, I only had Ivan uh, read chapter 10. Uh, we're going to reflect on a bit on chapter 11 as well. Uh, chapters 10, 11 and 12 really are one unit within the book of Daniel, but we're going to focus on chapter 12 uh, for our final talk next Sunday. Uh, so let me pray and seek God's help as we come to his word. Let's pray. Father Almighty, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you have spoken to us through your word. And as we come to this uh, incredible vision uh, that Daniel received many, many years ago, May your spirit be at work in us to help us understand how it speaks to us, your people here today. How it points to your son, Jesus. How it encourages us and comforts us, challenges us to live for him. We pray this for the glory of your name. Amen. All right, as uh, you've probably picked up on uh, uh, throughout this series, because um, I've mentioned it, uh, I uh, have this uh, love for old photos, and I've got this Facebook page that feeds them to me, uh, and I've got a new one to share with you this morning. Uh, so here we have three young women eating spaghetti on an inflatable mattress uh, at the island of Capri, which is near Naples, just off the coast of Italy. I mean, who wouldn't want to be doing that? <laughs> huh? It's like, almost like my dream holiday, floating on water off the coast of Italy, eating spaghetti. Uh, the year is 1939. Now, judging by where they are and their attire, I think it's pretty safe to assume it's summer. All right, so we're talking July, August. And here they are, seemingly without a care in the world, unknowingly uh, of what, unknowing of what is about to happen. Right? That just a month or two later, the world would be set on fire. Now, I'd be really interested to know what, what happened to these ladies and what became of their life uh, during that time. Because it seems in this moment, they're blissfully unaware of what's going on. But we're called to be different. Jesus said about his return that it would be like a thief coming in the night. And the point of what Jesus is saying isn't that, that it's going to catch you unaware. Right? It's not going to catch you off guard. It's that you don't know when a thief is going to come because thieves don't announce it, do they? At least if they're attempting to be a good thief. Right? Thieves don't announce when they plan to come and steal stuff. But you can be prepared for them. And so Jesus' point is that you, you don't know when I will return, but live in such a way that you are prepared for that moment whenever it should come. And here's the big point for today. Following Jesus in a hostile world is not about figuring out when Jesus will return. It's about the kind of people God calls you to be as you wait for Jesus to return. And there are three things that we're going to draw out from, from this part of the book of Daniel about the kind of people we should be as we wait for Jesus to return. Firstly, people who cherish the gospel. Secondly, people who know the deeper reality of our life. And thirdly, people who stand firm until the end. So firstly, people who cherish the gospel. So, uh, Daniel 10 verse 1 tells us, we're in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. This is rather odd, uh, because we know the return from exile has begun. 
right? Cyrus decreed it in his first year. Uh, you can read about it in the book of Ezra. In fact, that's how Ezra starts, chapter 1, verse 1. And yet Daniel is still in Babylon. Why? We don't know. I mean, we do know that you know, he, was, he was well into his 80s, probably you know, pushing close to his 90s. And perhaps he figured that he didn't have it in him to make that journey. But whatever the reason may be, we can be pretty sure that seeing his, his fellow Israelites leave the city for home would have been a, a deeply emotional moment, you know, tears of joy streaming down. But the people of God were not out of the woods, not by a long shot. As this vision, uh, in, particularly in chapter 11, makes clear. Uh, we, we know by the dates given that it's not long uh, since Passover, right? the festival of unleavened bread. Uh, there was a strict diet during that festival and Daniel being Daniel would have no doubt been keeping it. Uh, and it seems he felt the need to keep it going uh, for another couple of weeks. right? Daniel isn't hungry for food though. He's hungry for God. He wants him to reveal more of, of the meaning of, of these visions that he's been having. And we know this is the case from verse 12, right? The angel says to Daniel that he has come in response to Daniel humbling himself. The first day that you set your mind to gain understanding, says the angel. And as we read these accounts about the, these encounters and these visions that Daniel have, it's easy for us in 21st century uh, you know, Australia uh, to read these in the comfort of, of, of our homes on a couch by a warm fire in the middle of winter and go, wow, wow, how awesome would it have been to see that vision of, of the angel Gabriel or perhaps you know, the pre-incarnate son of God. It's not quite clear in this, in this, in this vision. A man with gold belts, body that sparkles like gemstones, face like lightning, eyes on fire, legs and arms, so shiny you can see your reflection. And what a voice. But here's the thing. It's never wow in the Bible. We might say that from the comfort of our couch, but it's never wow in the Bible. Have you noticed that? Whenever someone has an encounter like Daniel here in chapters 10 and 11, it's not wow. It's more, uh-oh. Right? The men with Daniel, they didn't stick around. They were terrified. And they couldn't even see what Daniel was seeing. And they broke the 100-meter world record to get out of there. And Daniel himself, verse 8, says his strength was sapped. He fell to the ground. His face turned deathly pale. I was helpless. Like anyone who comes into the presence of the pure glory and holiness of God. Even if it's only reflected through an angel. They're overcome with this complete sense of unworthiness. We see it again and again in Scripture. Being a prophet, that wasn't for everyone. Right? You were called to be a prophet. It wasn't an option that you sign up for at you know, Temple Careers Day. You, you know, when you read the prophets, you know that being called by God to speak his word to his people, you read books like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. Being called by God to speak his word to his people came at an immense cost. And we might think, oh, how great to be so close to God and see the things that they saw. But hearing the, the word as they did, that was a near-death experience. And then passing on the word of God often to people that wanted nothing to do with it, a people who would treat you like dirt and a people who often would kill the prophets for doing such a thing to dare to bring the word of God to them. Right? The point for you and me is the word of God came to us, the gospel came to us, to you and me, by the sacrifice and suffering of such men and women. 
You know, we don't feel that as much today because of how free our world is here in Australia with the gospel. Right? Daniel didn't know it at the time, but it, he's hungry for the gospel. For a clearer rev- revelation of God's saving grace, you know, clearer than the rather cryptic message about 77s back in chapter 9. How, how can that be? How is Daniel hungry for the gospel? Because the Spirit of God is at work in him. And it's actually Peter in his letter that helps us understand this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, Peter says, concerning this salvation, right? He's just talked about the great hope we have in Jesus. And he says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the spirit of christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of christ in the subsequent glories it's the spirit of god at work in daniel causing him to hunger for that word for that gospel and peter goes on it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you and me. Right? In the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things in which, into which angels long to look. We need to cherish the gospel. I mean, it's our salvation, of course, but we, we cherish it because of what it costs to come to us. Living for Jesus in a hostile world means we need to be thankful for the courageous men and women who God called to uh, endure this hostile world, who served you and me by proclaiming the gospel through the centuries so that I could do it to you here today. And that includes Daniel. And we should cherish it, not not only for the good news it truly is, about our salvation in Jesus, but because of what it cost for that good news to come to us. I mean, we might look back at visions like Daniel and think, wow. But you know what? Daniel is looking down on you and me right now. He's by God's side. This side of the cross and resurrection. This side of history where we know an intimacy through the Spirit of God in us that the Old Testament saints only dreamed of. And you know what Daniel's thinking? Wow. Following Jesus in a hostile world means we cherish the gospel. That's why Paul, Peter, John, they're so gloriously stubborn about getting the gospel right. About guarding the church from false teachers and prophets. To cherish the gospel is to take Paul's charge to Timothy seriously. Uh, In 2 Timothy 4.2, he says, Preach the word, be prepared in season, out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And what reason does Paul uh, give Timothy to preach the word? Well, Paul says, because you know the deeper reality we all face. Verse 1 of chapter 4 in 2 Timothy Paul says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And in the view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the gospel. And so this brings us to the second point about how we are to live uh, following Jesus in a hostile world as people are waiting for Christ to return. We are to know that deeper reality of life. In verses 10 and 10 to 12 in, in, in Daniel 10, uh, Daniel is helped to his hands and knees. He's encouraged that God loves him, that he need not be afraid. And Daniel stands up a little, still trembling. And then the angel gives a report of what he's been up to. And it's rather strange. Did you think that as it was read to us? Verse 13, the prince of 
of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. What on earth is he talking about? Well, in this verse, much like the visions Daniel has already received, the angel is pulling back the curtain on a deeper reality. You know, reality is much more than this material universe. There are forces at play that we cannot see unless God decides to pull back that curtain to give us a glimpse of a greater reality. We're told that there is a real struggle between the angels of God and others who oppose them. This is what the angel is talking about when he says the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted him for 21 days. I mean, while we scurry around like ants and, and nations war against nations, you know, and that's the history of the world, there are heavenly forces at work executing the will of God and there are those who seek to resist that will. And this is not some obscure verse that we can run away with and, and you know, and dream up all sorts of crazy ideas. No, 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 no. This is just one in a list of examples that you'll find in the Bible where God pulls back that curtain. For instance, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Israel is approaching Jericho. And we're told that Joshua looked up and saw a man with a sword drawn, the commander of the Lord's army, who was going into battle for his people. Only it wasn't the battle Joshua saw. Remember what they did is they just walked around, <laughs> blew a few trumpets, down comes the walls. Right? But there's a deeper reality going on. And it gives greater meaning to verse 27 in Joshua 5 where it says the Lord was with Joshua. Or take 2 Kings uh, chapter 6 uh, from verse 8 following. Uh, we, we learn that the Arameans are at war with Israel and Elisha the prophet is giving Israel's king uh, God-given inside info uh, on uh, Aram's movements. And the king of Aram hears about this and goes, so he tracks down Elisha, surrounds him in the town that he's in of Dothan. And Elijah's servant, he's scared out of his mind. Right? He comes running to Elisha and he's like, what are we going to do? And Elisha responds in verse 16, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha then prays to the Lord that the Lord might reveal that reality to the servant. And so we read in verse 17, Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And it's not only in the Old Testament. The Gospels. God pulls back the curtain. Jesus' transfiguration with Peter and John up on the mountain. Uh, Jesus' encounters with Satan and his demons. Paul goes on in his letters, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 10.20, when he talks about not sacrificing to pagan gods and idols, because he says if you do that, you're actually sacrificing to demons. Or Ephesians 6 and the armor of God. Paul says, put on the full armor of God. Why? So you can take your stand against ISIS Militant atheists? Communist China? No. Paul says against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. See, following Jesus in a hostile world is not about figuring out when Jesus is going to return. It's about the kind of people you're called to be as you wait for him to return. People who know that deeper reality and take comfort from it. People seem to have a vague sense of this, don't they? You'll hear them use expressions like, the universe is against me. Or they'll talk about Murphy's Law. Or they'll use the expression, this, this just wasn't meant to be. But the Spirit of God has opened our eyes to see who is truly in control of history. And this is what the angel does once more with Daniel. 
And so he goes on, he says, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. Here's the deeper reality, Daniel. And for the first half of the vision in chapter 11, the angel opens a window into the future battles and political plotting that will take place in in that region of the world. And then in verse 27, he, he says, The two kings with their hearts bent on evil will still sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail, because an end will still come at the appointed time. It's that phrase, at the appointed time. It says it again in verse 29. Verse 35 in chapter 11. If, you, if you've got your own Bible, you cannot... Look at it, uh, of course. Some of the wise will stumble as they, will, as they may be refined. So they may be refined. There's purpose in, in this uh, craziness that is going to go on. All right, verse 36, until the time of wrath has been completed, for what has been determined must take place. See, following Jesus in a hostile world it means to rest in that strange peace that we know that comes from knowing that deeper reality that God is in control. He's moving history towards its appointed end. Nothing happens apart from the will of God, says Jesus. Not a sparrow falls to the ground apart from my Father's will. Just sit with that for a moment. Not a sparrow falls to the ground. Think about all that is happening in the world right now. None of it is happening apart from the will of God. Does that make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? Because God does all that he pleases. Now, if that unsettles you, which it should... Right? This vision didn't give Daniel the warm and fuzzies. Not at first, anyway. But as the angel spoke the word of God to him, it strengthened him. So consider the ultimate word of God that has come to you. Jesus, the word made flesh. It pleased God to come to earth in the person of his son and die for you. It pleased him. It's what he wanted to do. Why? Because that's who he is. A God of unfailing love and grace. And we can trust that he has things in hand. As crazy as this life may get, as hostile as the world may become. Uh, I've used this illustration before, but it's so wonderfully apt. I'm going to use it again, and some of you, it might be new for you. This is the backside of a tapestry. Right? This is what our lives right here, in this snapshot of time, they can feel like this. The world is going nuts with all sorts of things going on with wars and Gender fluidity and all sorts of crazy ideas that are floating around. And personally, we might be experiencing things in our relationships, in our work. And life just feels like it's a mess. Like it's the backside of a tapestry. But this is what God is doing. He's working with those threads. We might not feel it. We might not see it. But he does. And all of history is laid out before him like the front side of a tapestry. He knows where every thread is meant to be. And he's weaving it together towards that perfect end. Either you simply live in ignorance of the world around you or the challenges of life, the craziness of this world, it'll bring you undone. Knowing the deeper reality brings a peace that transcends understanding. Because despite what we see and experience in our specific moment in history, despite the, uh, you know, the deeper reality of the, the spiritual struggle that is taking place, God is in control. Weaving the tapestry, moving history 
towards the appointed end he has for it. And this brings us to our final point, that we're called to be people who stand firm until the end. Right, the angel explains what previous visions, uh, you know, the visions that assaulted Daniel of beasts and four-headed leopards and uh, rams and goats with one horn and then suddenly four, four small horns. Oh, it's crazy stuff. But now in this vision in chapter 11, things are a little explained a little bit more plainly for Daniel. In chapter 8, Daniel receives a vision of the, how the Greek Empire will trounce the Persian Empire. Greek Empire was a bit of a flash in the pan. Very bright, potent flash, mind you. Uh, but it fell apart with the death of Alexander in 323 BC. And the kingdom was then split into four smaller kingdoms. Hence the leopard with four heads in chapter 7. And the large horn of the goat giving way to four smaller horns in chapter 8. And then chapter 11 effectively recounts a large chunk of history for us. Uh, the future for Daniel, about 300 years or so, fall of Persia, rise of Greece. Then, of particular note, of particular trouble for the people of God back in Jerusalem who had returned. Right? The constant tug of war between the Ptolemaic kingdom of the south and the Seleucid kingdom of the north. Right, time won't allow me to unpack uh, uh, how much of what the angel actually recounts in chapter 11 is supported by what we know in history. But you can go and research it. Maybe blueletterbible.com might have something on it. All right. dot org. Sorry, sorry, dot org, dot org. All right. But we're going to focus on one part. From verse 21 in chapter 11, the angel speaks of a contemptible person who becomes king of the northern kingdom. And we know that this is a guy whose name was Antiochus IV, uh, also known as Antiochus Epiphanes. And as the angel makes clear, he's a nasty piece of work. Right? He's going to cause real pain for the people of God. Uh, and who in verse 32, he will, he'll be the one who sets up this rather cryptic phrase, the abomination that causes desolation. What is that? Well, it's been mentioned before in chapter 9. Right? In the Old Testament, that word, abomination, is frequently connected to the worship and sacrifices to false gods. It comes up again and again, for instance, in the book of Ezekiel. And Antiochus IV, um, we know this from history, he was forcing Jews to make sacrifices to pagan gods in the temple. Idols that he had set up. He was burning copies of the law and he even sacrificed a pig on the altar. The connection there, Jews, pigs. Right, an elderly man we know by the name of Mattathias refused to offer the sacrifice. He ended up killing a fellow Jew who had given in um, and a, an officer of, of the Seleucids. Uh, and that kick-started something that we now know as the Maccabean Revolt. Right, he fled to the mountains, died not long after, but his five sons led a rebellion. Key among them was a guy named Judas, who was later nicknamed Maccabeus. It means hammer. He led the revolt. And they succeeded in driving back Antiochus's forces, uh, restored purity to worship in the temple in 164 BC. And this is actually still celebrated by many Jews today. And it's called, anyone know? Hanukkah. Right, all very interesting. But here's the real point we need to focus on. Verse 45. Look what the angel says. He will pitch his royal tent He'll try and make a kingdom for himself, yet he will come to an end and no one will help him. That is the constant beat of the drum in the book of Daniel. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, but the kingdom of God is forever. Well, if this is about Antiochus IV, what does it have to do with you and me today? Well, here's the key thing we should understand about this kind of uh, prophetic, apocalyptic 
uh, writing in the Bible. It has layers of fulfilment. Jesus himself takes the warning about the abomination that causes desolation, applies it to the people of God in his day, Matthew 24, 15. So when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, run for the hills, says Jesus. What is Jesus talking about there? He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. When Rome rolled in under the the leadership of uh, Titus, who was the general at the time, um, uh, who would later become uh, emperor, uh, and he set up the Roman standards and, you know, in the temple and he made sacrifices and it's believed that he also sacrificed a pig on the altar. The abomination. And Jesus himself took a prophecy that had a clear focus for Daniel and then he reapplied it to his own time. Why? Because as the book of Revelation makes wonderfully clear, history is just doing this thing where it goes around and around and around, just repeats, repeats, repeats until the end. So we today can take this prophecy. We're not trying to connect every little detail to something specific so that we can go, yep, Jesus is returning this Thursday. No. We, we, We look at it. And we look at the kings of our world who set themselves up against God and those who cause terrible trouble for God's people and we know they will come to an end. Following Jesus in a hostile world is not about figuring out when Jesus will return. It's about the kind of people we're called to be as we wait for Jesus to return. And the common refrain of chapter 11 is that the people of God, they're going to face struggles again and again from a hostile world. And so the angel says in verse 32, speaking about Antiochus, with flattery he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. We we see that in history. Many Jews were happy to offer their sacrifices to the pagan gods in the temple. But the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Those who are wise will instruct many. Though for a time they will fall by the sword, be burned, captured, plundered, right? Persecution is a part of life. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined until the time of the end. It's the way that the New Testament speaks to us. When Jesus in Matthew 24 talks about how we need to be wise and faithful servants as we wait for the master's return. It's how Paul speaks to us when he writes in uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verses 11 to 16. But you, men of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame. Here it is, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. Right? Following Jesus in a hostile world is not about figuring out when Jesus will return. Hopefully you're getting that. It's about the kind of person you are as you wait for his return. And so we read in other places like 2 Peter 3.11, you know, since everything will be destroyed in this way, right? Peter's uh, writing about the end of all things and that it's, you know, that it's coming... And he asks the question in verse 11, what kind of people ought you to be? And this is what he says. He says, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. How to live knowing the end is coming? God isn't expecting you to figure it all out. He's saying to you, trust that I already have. And we're to, we're to live this life that the New Testament calls us to again and again and again of godliness and holiness in response to that grace that God has shown us in Jesus. Or as you know, John Newton, the person responsible for the world famous hymn, Amazing Grace, he wrote, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. 
but still I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's how you live for Christ, waiting for his return. Right? And you notice in, this, in these chapters, you know, Daniel's strength is not his own. It's given to him. When the word is given to him, and so we come back to Ephesians 6 and the armor of God. Something that is given to you so you can stand strong. So that you can know that you are loved more than you can possibly fathom. Whose armor is it? It's God's armor. It's not yours. It's his armor that he gives to you. Truth. Righteousness, peace, salvation. And of course the promise that he is with us through it all. Following Jesus in a hostile world is not about figuring out when Jesus will return. It's about the kind of people we're called to be as we wait for Jesus' return. People who cherish the gospel. People who know the peace of the deeper reality. And people who stand firm. Stand firm in the grace of God until the end. Let's pray. Father Almighty, we give you thanks and praise for Jesus. And Lord, we do look forward to his return. And so we pray that you would help us to be the people we are called to be as we wait for him to return. That we would be people who cherish the good news of your son, Jesus. That we would know the peace that comes from knowing that deeper reality in our world, that you are at work and that you are in control. And that we would stand firm, stand firm in the grace, stand firm with the armour that you have given us. Stand firm until the end. When Jesus returns, and we shall live with him forever. Lord, we pray this for your glory and in Jesus' name.